When Christianity was new and people were being persecuted and killed for their faith as followers of Jesus, no one questioned the sincerity of anyone claiming to be a Christian. The authors of various books in the New Testament wrote as though anyone reading their letters must be a fellow member of this incredible new movement. But as Christianity became more obviously linked with the political establishment, and especially as it became linked with worldly success and popularity, it also became necessary to question exactly what it is that distinguishes a genuine Christian from one who is just coming along for the ride. In this video, I will be listing five different criteria that people have used to identify and define Christianity over the years. See if you can work out which one is the right one. Number one, church membership. For the average person and for governments and other large bodies looking on from the outside, Christianity is related to membership in certain organizations, usually called churches. That was most obvious in the early days, when a letter addressed to a church, whether it was in Corinth or Thessalonica or Jerusalem, went to all those persecuted saints who lived together in that location. There were no denominations, and only rarely were there infiltrators. As I said earlier, if you were part of such a visible group of people, you were assumed to have the unique characteristics of whatever a Christian is. No further questions were asked. And so even today, encyclopedias and census forms pretty much define Christians or Christianity as the combined membership of all those visible organizations who call themselves Christian. Tick the right box and you're in. Never mind that hardly any organization amongst the thousands of them accepts that all of the others can be legitimately described as Christians. There is almost universal agreement that some other criteria is needed for identifying who are truly Christians and who are not. It's just that each group has different criteria. Jesus taught that his kingdom was invisible, that only his Father knows who's in it and who is not. Consequently, there is no true church in the form of a visible organization, even though many have tried to claim such a title. God judges each person individually now, and he judges them according to each person's experience and understanding of the truth. Number two, supernatural power. Another assumption, which goes back to the very first Christians, is that we recognize true Christians on the basis of supernatural evidence. Most notably, the power to heal people instantly and miraculously. But often on the basis of lesser evidence, such as the person's ability to speak in unknown tongues, called glossolalia. Even Paul, who is most remembered for his teachings, boasted that he had demonstrated supernatural power, performing, quote, signs and wonders, as a way of convincing his audiences that he had come from God. You can see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, and in Romans 15, verses 18 and 19. Most professing Christians believe Jesus did miracles, lots of them. And most professing Christians believe in his resurrection from the dead. A few, Pentecostals in particular, boast of being able to replicate those miracles today. But, for the most part, supernatural power seems to be the exception more than the rule, even in Pentecostal churches. Millions have turned to the Pentecostals for things like healing and deliverance from evil spirits. The movement was widely believed to have been the single most significant force in 20th century Christianity, as people all over the world flocked to witness and experience a miracle for themselves. While some genuine miracles did apparently happen, most went home much the same as they were when they arrived. As more and more of these so-called miracle workers were caught up in scandals and even exposed as hoaxes, the religious world sank into even greater disillusionment than they had before the Pentecostal revival. Jesus himself taught that it is only an evil generation that seeks miracles. Certainly, basing faith on who can do the most spectacular miracle is not, for most of us, a wise or safe way to find the truth. It only encourages more and more lying signs and wonders by religious conmen. 
This is something which the Bible predicted would happen in the last days before Jesus returned. And so, it seems wise to look for some other criteria for recognizing true Christians. And so we come to answer number three, theological statements. There are some books in the New Testament which appear to have been written for the express purpose of defining Christianity in a way that would distinguish the genuine from the counterfeit. By the time that the Apostle John wrote his epistles and the Gospel of John, there were several teachings which John deliberately set out to refute. A number of statements of faith were composed, most notably the Apostles' Creed, in order to define more precisely what Christianity actually stands for. Some of those creeds have endured down to the present and are recited by members of some churches every week, on the assumption that this will protect them from falling into error theologically and thus missing out on all that is promised to the true followers of Jesus. Still, there is no evidence to suggest that reciting these creeds each week has had any significant effect on people who choose to commit some of the most vile sins throughout the week. His chosen followers only gradually came to believe that Jesus was the Messiah or the Son of God, and that was after witnessing him in action, something that we don't have access to today. It is interesting to note that it was the devil himself who first publicly confessed that Jesus was the Son of God. And Jesus rebuked the devil for saying so. He apparently was not impressed with such statements. He said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but then you refuse to obey the things that I have taught? So now we come to answer number four, religious experiences. In an effort to define Christian faith on the basis of something internal and personal, a movement has persisted since the time of the Reformation which insists that there is some kind of a personal spiritual experience that happens at the moment when someone ceases to be a non-Christian and starts a new life as a Christian. In Bible times, this was sometimes equated with water baptism although it was not long at all before numerous divisions grew out of arguments over the exact way in which water baptism should be done. It is probably the single greatest source of divisions amongst Christians to this day. Those who objected to infant baptism in particular wanted to locate a point at which something changed in the consciousness of the individual. In the 20th century, this experience was popularly labeled as being born again, although there have been other names, such as entire sanctification, to describe similar emotional experiences. And there is in America in particular a tradition of altar calls, where people are asked to come to the front of the church at the end of a sermon, to say a prayer, sign a card, or just pray silently for God to change them into whatever it is that Christians are. Unfortunately, Religious experience is extremely subjective. Some people might report a powerful, life-changing experience, whereas others report that nothing at all happened when they went through the required motions. To counter that argument, it then became popular to teach that one did not need to experience anything. The mere fact that they said the prayer, that they were asked to pray, marked the day when they ceased being lost and were suddenly and eternally saved, born again. Pastors and evangelists would teach this quite passionately, and the masses needed only to believe the authenticity of such a promise to become true, born-again believers. Most were told that no matter how much they sinned from that point on, they could never lose their salvation, because they had done all that was needed just by saying the prayer. God would do all the rest. In fact, God was forced to do all the rest because he actually dislikes anyone trying to be good to show that they are Christians. They call it working your way to heaven. And it is condemned as the worst sin of all. Well, obviously, the search for a personal experience was being supplanted by yet another creed, and this one was far more dangerous than the earlier ones because it outlawed all attempts to exercise self-discipline. Any change in behavior was expected to come virtually without human effort. 
This born-again teaching is even more widespread than the Pentecostal teaching. But it, too, has failed to work effectively as a defining line between true Christianity and false Christianity. Largely because it's something that neither Jesus nor any of his followers ever taught. And that brings us to the final criteria for distinguishing the genuine from the counterfeit. Answer number five, adherence to the teachings of Jesus. In the teachings of Jesus, we have something we can examine and even experiment with right now, even though Jesus himself is not present with us. We can compare what he taught with anything anyone else has ever taught. We can experiment with following some of those teachings to see if they work today. When we do that, we find that Jesus stands head and shoulders above all the rest. Not only the teachings of other great philosophers, but the teachings of every so-called Christian denomination in the world today as well. Christianity, as taught by Jesus, has gone the way of the dinosaur. But it does not need to stay dead. We can put it into practice right now. And when we do, we will see that his teachings really are the missing piece in all that calls itself Christian in the world today. Without those teachings, everything sours. Religious piety turns into showing off. Preaching becomes a form of greedy manipulation. Fellowship becomes backbiting and self-righteousness. Evangelism becomes intolerance. And tolerance becomes indifference to the will of God. Ah, yes, there are thousands of religious buildings out there, but they are each missing that all-important cornerstone. They are all built on sand. The Pope, Kenneth Copeland, Norman Vincent Peale, Billy Graham, Joyce Meyer, you name them, they will all have to stand before Jesus and explain why they were ashamed to promote his teachings the way he taught them. And after they do, he says that he will profess before all the angels of heaven, he never knew these people. What they taught was their own concoction. I can hear the outcry now. Hang on, you just mentioned someone who I think is doing or has done a wonderful job of preaching the gospel. If I've not listed someone that you think has got it together, then add your own name or the name of your pastor to the list instead. I want you to be outraged by what I'm saying because I know that only those people who have really discovered the teachings of Jesus and started putting them into practice in their own life will know just how true it is what I'm saying now. Everyone else will be indignant because their loyalty is to the counterfeit, not to Jesus himself.